Praise be Jesus and Mary. Today we celebrate the third Sunday of Lent and the readings for the Mass, at least for the most part, focus on the theme of water, thirst, water and its purifying action, how it quenches obviously bodily thirst. And then there the, there's the analogous role of water, you know, in the spiritual life, you know, in the Christian life, particularly in the sacrament of baptism. In fact, the Sunday Mass readings during Lent have been selected in view of those who are preparing for baptism, you know, at Easter time. So especially for them, for their instruction during these very important weeks, that they be prepared you know, for holy baptism. For our part, we who are already blessed to be baptized, you know, Lent is a wonderful time to renew our commitment to holy baptism. You know, the solemn promises we made you know, to reject sin, Satan, and to, to live for our Lord and to believe in him, you know, to um, strive for holiness, and in a particular way to, to quench that thirst within us for the water that our Lord offers to us, the living water, he himself, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Today's gospel passage from John chapter four and narrates the encounter of our Lord with a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. You know, we um, can only analyze briefly and in part this lengthy passage, very important, just bringing out only um, one particular aspect of it, a lesson for us. You know, the dialogue between Jesus and the woman you know, reveals, first of all, the woman's thirst, obviously going to the well for water, and for herself and for her family and so forth. Um, but eventually in that dialogue is revealed her thirst for something more, the living water described by our Lord to her early on in that conversation with her. You know, that water that he offers to her, which would quench her thirst and be thirsty no longer. A mysterious, spiritual kind of water. And even before that, we learn of Jesus' own thirst, you know, for the conversion and sanctification, you know, of that Samaritan woman, and for all souls for that matter. You know, you will recall as one of the, the final words of our Lord on the cross, I thirst, you know, I thirst for souls, you know, the salvation of souls that I have made. Our Lord reveals that here, you know, by saying to the woman, Give me a drink. It was an occasion for our Lord. His, he was physically thirsty, you know, being on um, long trips with his disciples from town to town. And uh, no doubt on this occasion, he sat down the well and was, you know, thirsty. And this uh, was an opportunity for our Lord to, uh, when the Samaritan woman came, you know, to lead her you know, to faith in him. And after her, you know, many others who came through her witness. So our Lord said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the woman is, she's understandably slow, you know, to uh, you know, understand our Lord, what he's getting at, you know, this living water. She's on a mundane level at first and remarks even that Jesus doesn't even have a bucket to draw out water from the well there. So how could he give her this living water? So this is what Jesus replies. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I shall give will never thirst. The water I shall give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And then gradually the woman begins to understand. She catches on and she begins to open her heart to Christ and to the gift he offers to her of this living water. Sir, give me this water so that I may not be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. The Samaritan woman represents all of us in some ways 
And you know, she represents the, the thirsty soul you know, who desires our Lord, who is being called you know, to him you know, for conversion and, and sanctification, to eternal life. And her response could be made our own as well. Give me this water. We all desire the water that quenches more than bodily thirst. We can't live without H2O you know, for very long. So we do, of course, have our, our desire for that, that natural desire. But ordinary water quenches our thirst only for a short while, you know, a very short period of time. You know, but we desire more than that. We desire the living water you know, that quenches our spiritual thirst forever. We not only thirst for this kind of water, we are not only thirst, but in a certain sense, we are living thirsts. You know, we are living thirsts. Our human nature has been made in such a way as to thirst, spiritually speaking, for the very one who made it, who made us, your know, God and God alone. We can always repeat St. Augustine's saying, in the first lines of his confessions, you have made us for thyself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. You know, our hearts will always be restless, always thirsting until we possess our Lord eternally in heaven. The psalmist puts it very beautifully and accurately in Psalm 42. As the deer yearns for running streams, so my soul yearns for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. The psalmist speaks, of course, for the whole people of Israel. He speaks for every single one of us. And St. Ambrose, he makes this comment on this passage, as well as an exhortation to us. Let us take refuge like deer beside the fountain of waters. Let our soul thirst as David thirsted for the fountain. What is this fountain? Listen to David. With you is the fountain of life. Let my soul say to this fountain, when shall I come and see you face to face? For the fountain is God himself. Later in the dialogue, Jesus says this, but the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And indeed the Father seeks such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Our Lord calls each and every one of us to drink deeply you know, from the fountain of living water he offers to us, you know, the, the living water that comes through the various channels you know, of divine grace you've know, given us in and through Holy Mother Church, beginning with the Word of God, the sacraments, especially the most blessed sacrament. We are nourished in a particular way at every Holy Mass, every Holy Communion, the greatest grace we have, our Lord himself. Then, of course, prayer. We can always receive you know, God's graces through prayer. And then finally, and there's other things, other channels, of course, but this needs to be mentioned in a special way, imitating Our Lady and in union with her to be docile, perfectly docile, and abandon ourselves completely to the Holy Spirit. Her whole life was as such. The Catechism of the Catholic Church affirms this. The Holy Spirit is the living water welling up to eternal life in the heart that prays. It is he who teaches us to accept it at its source, Christ. The Holy Spirit is the living water in some ways. True devotion to the Holy Spirit we can speak about True devotion to the Holy Spirit is, is very important because he, or to him, is appropriated, given that special task, as it were, of our sanctification. He is the one responsible for making us Christ-like, who forms us into other Christs, if you would have it, Christ himself, spiritually, mystically. He is the one who makes us holy, makes us saints, Little wonder he's, he is uh, referred to as the sanctifier, you know, God the sanctifier. The Holy Spirit's work within us, it could be constant, it would be constant, 
uh, you know, sanctification is continuous, but alas, you know, such is not the case for many a Christian soul. Hopefully it's not the case for us, but perhaps we are not so docile to the Holy Spirit, maybe even forgetful or indifferent to him, to his very presence within our souls. As long as we're in the state of sanctifying grace, we are the temples of the Holy Spirit, are we not? We ought not to wait for Pentecost, several weeks, months almost from now, to begin thinking about the Holy Spirit and inviting him anew into our lives. Rather, we should grow daily in our devotion, a true devotion to the Holy Spirit in imitation of Our Lady. And this will lead to you know, really a, a rapid growth in our formation into Christ, our sanctification. So we should keep this in mind during this Lenten season. You know, the, um, the world expects from us as Christians to, to be holy. Our Lord expects us to be holy to begin with, but the world does in a sense too. You know, um, we're going through you know, a, you know, a crisis, you know, a major crisis in the world. You know, and I think that it's because you know, too many Christians are just not being really Christian. They are not living up to their call to holiness. And this is a great tragedy. You know, the, the world and its um, continual descent into you know, the abyss of immorality and, uh, and all those uh, sins that are even uh, unmentionable. You know, um, you know, the world needs most to uh, not only balance that out, you know, the evil in the world with goodness, uh, righteousness, and holiness, and virtue, but to even, you know, uh, overcome it, you know, you know with, uh, uh, we need a, a, a season of saints, as it were, a great s a season of sanctity, you know, um, in the life of the church. Nothing else will really change things. You know, and so if enough of us you know, really are docile to the Holy Spirit and his action within us of making us holy, then really nothing you know, uh, can uh, stop us you know, from, uh, from changing this world, you know, uh, bringing souls to Christ while there's still time, you know, bringing mercy to souls and, and, uh, and changing things for the better and uh, saving our culture, our nation you know, from the clutches of Satan. So we all need to be, to be holy, especially in these times, you know, to be saints. And if, again, if there are enough of us, you know, and that may not mean, have to mean uh, the majority of us, but many of us, several of us, we hope all of us here, you know, to really be holy, to strive to be great saints, and we'll do a wonderful thing, you know, for our society, for the church. I'd like to conclude with a... Um, a few words from the holy uh, late Cardinal Mercier of Belgium. He was a holy uh, prelate of the church in Belgium uh, last century, uh, known for his, uh, his great love for uh, Our Lady, especially promotion of uh, the dogma of the uh, mediation of all graces on the part of Our Lady. But he had a great devotion to the Holy Spirit, obviously, um, which comes with a, a, a true devotion to Our Lady. You know, can have a counterpart to it. But he's got these, these words, famous words, that you perhaps are familiar with in the short prayer you know, uh, to the Holy Spirit, which I'd like to conclude with. And uh, he says, it's a secret of sanctity, and says, I am going to reveal to you a secret of sanctity and happiness. If every day during five minutes you will keep your imagination quiet Shut your eyes to all the things of sense, and close your ears to all the sound of earth, so as to be able to withdraw into the sanctuary of your baptized soul, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, speaking there to that Holy Spirit, saying, O Holy Spirit, soul of my soul, I adore thee. Enlighten, guide, strengthen, and console me. Tell me what I ought to do, and command me to do it. I promise to be submissive in everything that thou permittest to happen to me. Only show me what is thy will. If you do this, 
your life will pass happily and serenely. Consolation will abound even in the midst of the troubles. Grace will be given in proportion to the trial as well as strength to bear it, bringing you to the gates of paradise full of merit. This submission to the Holy Spirit is the secret of sanctity. Praise be Jesus and Mary. Oh.